Well, let me maximize until Visual Studio is done loading. I'm not Visual Studio. Come on, there we go. I'm up Like this bigger. What assignment? So there's a uh, two individual assignments: there's security oh, and okay. disaster recovery. Those are the last two mm -hmm. individual assignments. So as I said, I just wanted to talk about them a little bit, <clears throat> give you what you need to do your assignment, and probably a little bit more. Because I'm going to show you how to implement it in the database, but I'm not going to ask you to do it for your assignment. Does that make sense? But I thought you should see it. <clears throat> what kinds of security issues can a database have, just in general? What, what, are we, what are we looking at when we're looking at security? Right, so you don't want to, you want to prevent damage to the database. And where can that come from? Oh yeah. So there's there's those are actually more rare than what you're kind of the accident. Um, such as an update table without a you know where clause. Yeah. Are you on a new query? I'm not, I haven't started a query. This is just WordPad. <laughs> so the main thing is that there are malicious attacks sometimes for a database, especially if your database has valuable information. They are, though, much more rare than just accidents that hurt the data. The mo if you have garbage data, your database isn't worth anything, right? So you want to be you want to guard against accidentally inserting garbage, uh, uh, mistakes like updates or deletes. Just you know you. Want to um, even malicious attacks more typically come from a user that already has permissions. They're they're much more rare from a hacker. It happens, obviously, but it's uh, much more likely that a disgruntled employee will attack you than a malicious hacker from Russia or Germany. <clears throat> and they have access. If you, um, one of the things that database administrators are often very bad at is when uh, an employee is fired or removed, you need to remove them from the database immediately. If you don't, there's a window of time in which they can, you know, cause some damage <laughs> in revenge. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Accidents can happen a lot. I mean, just if you're not careful about if people have too many permissions and, you know, and, and if uh, your forms aren't validated very well, there's a lot of different ways that accidents can happen that will compromise your database and make it so that the data isn't as reliable as you would like. This is a big you know, a big topic, really. Uh, the thing is that when we do this, we should think about security uh, from the very beginning, all right? If you notice the book, in most books, it's like the last chapter, and it should probably be the first chapter, because <laughs> you should think about security from the very beginning when you're designing the database. Especially, I mean, databases that hold um, you know, like credit cards, social security numbers, those kinds of things are really, you know, they have to be tight. Just as an advice for you, if you're ever developing a database or you're developing uh, this for, insofar as possible, I would avoid storing 
like credit card numbers and things like that, I would buy a second party. You know, even if it's just PayPal, I would get somebody responsibility if at all possible, because it's a it's very dangerous to hold that information. You really need to be tight on your security to do that. If you're making web pages too, it's it's dangerous to take those things in, so you have to be really careful. It, it's a whole lot safer, but not necessarily always. Depending on what the business is, I mean, you may not have the option of shelling it to PayPal or somewhere. But if you can, that's a lot safer. They take responsibility. You don't have to. <laughs> um, there are two big aspects of just database. Um, these are two key words. What is authentication? Yeah, well, well, that can be these days. Yeah, are you a real person, not a robot? That's what you have to type in. Yeah, are you the person you claim to be? Right. That's basically it. Are you the person you claim to be? The typical way that this has been done, and one of the least secure ways possible, is password and username. Right, do the password and username match? And it's really um, not very secure for lots of reasons. Um, so, do you guys know what a dictionary attack is? That's when you throw all the different things at you, just try everything. Right, so typically you uh, hash or you hash the password so that it's not an English word or anything. But all they have to do is know what hash method you're using, and they can go through a dictionary and see if anything matches, right? So one of the things that you should never do with a password is just use a word. <laughs> you can actually, it's some, sometimes more, fairly secure to use a phrase, but uh, you don't want to ever use just a word that actually is in the dictionary. They got big rules now. They, they they've got a lot of, words. yeah. Some of the rules aren't I mean, all that useful. It's hard for somebody to remember it. Right. The other big danger with passwords is that because we have so many of them, uh, we the write them down. <laughs> and if you write them down, they're always vulnerable to being taken. And then websites have so many different parameters that you have to so it's kind of hard to just have one, two, passphrases. Number sign or there's a lot of, um, like our passwords at the default one here, this is an app sign. I can't find so. <laughs> A number and another number. That meets the minimum requirements for SQL Server. That's what they do. Right? So you have a non alphanumeric character, you have a capital letter, you have lowercase letters, you have numbers. So you combine this. That isn't that necessarily that hard to guess, though, I think. Well, not when you use something like that. Yeah. But uh, it does meet the minimum requirements. Meeting the minimum requirements, as I can show, is, are not necessarily secure. But the thing is, again, we have so many passwords. There are other ways to authenticate. Anybody know some of them? What's the degree of logged onto the machine using that authentication? So there is, we actually do have a Windows authentication with SQL Server. You can log into Windows and your Windows account can be mapped to the SQL Server, usually through Active Directory. There's ones where if you're logged on or something, it texts you a, a code and then you have to write Right, so that's, what do they call that, uh, two-step authentication? Yeah. I use that on my Google, yeah, for keystroke tops. What? Say again, I was only getting. What are keystroke cops? I'm not sure. Keystone cops? Google, five ways to authenticate. I know that it, when you, because I just set this up because I had someone trying to hack into my account. Um, I think because I kept getting password notifications. Oh. So I set it up so that it sends me a text message when I when I log in and I have to put in that 
something from that text message into it. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's a two step, which is getting more popular, but is extremely annoying. Yes. <laughs> well, there's checksums and things like that. I was thinking of things like uh, um, biometrics. Fingerprints, yeah. Fingerprints, eye scans. Um, I don't know. Someday they'll have you do a genetic test or something, probably. Voice recognition, Voice recognition. yeah. Voice, Voice recognition, I would not trust much, but yeah. yeah. In my laptop, it'll do um, facial recognition. Right, and facial is getting much. Better to who has been scanning all of everybody's pictures and developing identity. So whenever you tag somebody in Facebook, they scan it, and then they can see if that same person, if they scanned later, to see if it matches. So they're just experimenting with uh, face recognition, but it's interesting <laughs> that they're doing that. Biometrics tends to be safer, uh, but not if, most machines can't do it. Fingerprints somewhat. Although I could never get it to read my fingerprint, you know, with uh, when my old laptop too greasy or something, I don't know. Um, there's also uh, another way that things often are done are certificates. Anybody know much about certificates? The central server keeps track of your authentication. Right, and and the thing about certificates that I always I don't know if I, if I hold how secure they are. They, they're used a lot. But essentially, the way you get a certificate, anybody know? You go to the company, and they may say, uh, I am who I say I am, because I paid money to be who I say I am. I mean, you buy the certificate. And then you can pass the certificate to, uh, like, the SQL Server or something. And then uh, there's also a check to say whether the certificate is current in the databases of the people that sold it. So it's a, it, it's still there's a lot of trust there. If it's not current, everybody you know, occasionally get those web pages that say, "Do you want to go here because the certificate is not current?" Mm -hmm. Pierce College is that way. Every time I've ever tried to log in there. <laughs> <laughs> they never paid for another certificate, I guess. <laughs> um, but you know, that's basically you're trusting that somebody would not have paid to get the certificate. I assume that the authentication, the company authenticates it to some extent. Too. But that certificates are another way to do this. There are also other things which I'm not going to go into much. There's real encryption. Um, encryption is where you basically there's two forms of encryption. One is where both people have the same key, uh, and everything is encrypted, turned into gobbledygook, you know. But if you have the key, you can decrypt it. That's I forget the name of that one. Anybody been doing any security classes? I'm trying to remember. There's a name for that kind of key where both people oh, have the. Uh, robot, uh, where, where both people have the same key. Because there's also a uh, type of uh, encryption where people, there's a public key and a private key. What? Well, no, there's a, there's a it, just in general, there's basically two types of encryption. Right? So public key, private key, or both have the same key. And I, yeah, there's terms for them, and I'm not remembering the terms. <laughs> So these are all different ways to authenticate. And, and basically, it's just trying to prove that you are who you say you are. That's what all of authentication is about. And there are lots of ways to do it, and none of them are foolproof. Someday, as I said, they may have scams that will be more foolproof. But most of the time, it comes down to a password and a username. And uh, that's probably the least secure of all. <laughs> But that's what most things use. So, partially because you can't expect people to have like the biometric things, 
you know, face scans, fingerprint scans, eye scans. <laughs> Supposedly the eye scans are they're getting those where you just look into a camera and it can scan it pretty well. And despite um, was it uh, oh the minority report the, the they can tell if your eye is alive or not. <laughs> Why is fingerprints on my Samsung? Yeah, fingerprints can work. Um, as I said, but you get the scan exactly right. Right, I know. I can never get it to scan. Yours works pretty fine. Yeah. So it means uh, I think. Uh, well, so uh, it's a lot of laptops. Yeah. I never had it. Same this thing down here. Push it. A lot of laptops have it. Some phones. Um, my phone has it. I don't have it set up right now. Yeah. There's another way. Microsoft's been playing with, and a few of them where instead of doing passwords, you do. They put up pictures. Have you guys seen that? They put up pictures on your screen and you draw a line. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. A pattern. Yeah, you draw a pattern. Mm -hmm. And presumably your pattern would be unique. I don't know. Could I draw the same pattern twice? I don't know how tight it is. <laughs> remembering a pattern is kind of Yeah, and, and remembering a pattern might be harder than remembering a password. I, I don't know. But, but there are lots of, as I said, lots of different things. OK, so that's authentication. What's authorization? Once you've authenticated someone, whether or not they have the rights to do something. Right, so you're authorizing what they can do, right? You're giving what permissions do they have. And this is actually sort of where we get into the assignment. I'm going to show you a little bit of this. But when you're talking about the database itself, authorization usually takes the form of whether you can do certain commands. We did a little bit of SQL, so you've seen most of the commands. Can they select, right? So can this user select? And you do this table by table, right? What does select mean? What can they do? Read the data. They can read. That's all they can do, right? With a select permission. Uh, insert means they can write data. Um, update and they can change. So it's write and change, right? So I'll put write. And these are the permissions. I mean, these are basically when you're talking about databases, you're talking about permissions like this. So delete, right? So can they remove data? There are some other permissions, too, um, which I'm not so worried about. But there's ex, exec or execute. Anybody have an idea what that would be used for? Procedures. Yeah. Basically, if you're going to run a stored procedure, you have to have an execute permission. So it's basically to run procedures. And one of the things I'm going to talk about with um, security, one of the things that you can do is you can build a layer of views and stored procedures and triggers and things into the database where basically the user never gets to touch the tables directly. They have to do everything through stored procedures. Uh, so you have to give them the execute permissions for those. It's safer to do that. It's a lot of work to build that layer. But um, There's also... Um, Create. What do you think that's for? And other things. Yeah. It basically, if they have the permission to create, they can create database objects, including. If they don't have this, they can't even create a temp table. So you have to think about what their use. You know what things are going to do. There's alter. Uh, which is, allows you to modify uh, database objects. And then there's drop. Whoa, what did I just do? I don't want an image. <laughs> and drop lets you remove database objects, right? So it's different than delete. 
delete removes the data from an, like a table. Drop removes the table. Drop is even worse, deadly. Well, let's just do. So if you drop a table, it's gone and all of its data too. <laughs> okay. So when we're doing the assignments, which I'll talk about more here, I'm more interested in select, insert, update, and delete rather than these others right now. But I just wanted to show you what all the permissions are. Something you call DDL. What? Is that DDL as opposed to DML? So there's, yeah, there's DDL and what's the other one? DD, DM. Yeah. So one is to um, create the database objects and stuff, and the other is manipulating the data. I think the M is. So, okay, so these are the different kinds of uh, permissions that they can have. Let me show you. The other thing is I want to mention under authentication. SQL Server has two kinds of authentication. I mentioned we talked about one, Windows authentication, and then there's also SQL Server authentication. And I'm going to show you a little bit of these. And as I said, I'm going to show you a little bit more than you need for the data, the assignment. Then I'm going to show you the stuff you actually need for the assignment. Some of this is that. Windows authentication means that your current Windows account is mapped to SQL Server. Now that has to be done. Can you see it? I don't know if it's. I will post this too. Um, so Windows authentication means that you have, as I said, usually it's done through Active Directory. You take an account in Active Directory and you give them certain permissions in SQL Server. So when they log into Windows, they're automatically logged into SQL Server with their permissions preset. Microsoft says that's the best way to do things. The trouble with that is, is it doesn't work if you are coming in on a Mac. It doesn't work if you're coming in through the internet necessarily. So if you're having to deal with uh, multiple diverse types of login, then you need to use um, the SQL Server authentication, which is comes back down usually to a password and a username. Okay. So it's not as it's not as uh, secure is what Microsoft says. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's look at SQL Server. I think. Do you guys have questions on these? The main thing to remember is that there's authentication and auth you know authentication and authorization there's getting into the database figuring out if you are who you say you are and then if you are who you say you are what permissions do you have so i'm going to show this in sql server and as i said you guys don't have to do it in sql server but i thought you guys might want to see it i'm probably going to use you guys have community assist right I'll use Community Assist. You might notice um, there's two security folders. I know this is tiny for the back. The inner security folder is for the database, and the outer security folder is for the server. Right? One server can have many databases. So in the outer one, there's a thing called logins. And I'm going to I'll do a new login. Logins are for hooking up to the server. Logins allow you to connect to the server. So I'm going to right click and do a new login. I'll show you the SQL for this too in a minute. It's actually pretty easy. Um, so when you have a new login, Notice it says Windows Authentication. So I'm going to change this to SQL Server Authentication, partially because I don't want to have to create a new Windows user and go back and forth, log in and out of Windows to show it. So I'm going to give the login name. Oh, who do we want to log in as? Joe? <laughs> what? Boo. Boo? Foo? Ah, yeah, so programming. 
<laughs> Fubar. <Foo> yes. <laughs> um, so we'll do foo. Uh, we need to give it a password. I'm going to do something that you should never do. I'm going to uncheck enforce password policy. The password policy is what makes you do things like this. You should never undo that. Uh, but I'm going to, my password is going to be P-A-S-S, <laughs> which it would not allow if I hadn't unchecked those other things. Again, you should never uncheck those things. Okay, so there are some things here. This is actually enough to create this. There's some tabs over here. There are some built-in server roles. I'm not going to go into them in much detail because they're kind of above our grade right now. But there's like bulk admin, which allows you to handle bulk inserts into databases. There's database creator. There's disk administrator, process administrator. These are all roles that exist. Everybody has public by default, and you cannot remove public. But what public gives you is the permission to connect, nothing else. Right? You can't do anything else. You can just uh, connect. There's some stuff you can do with user mapping. This Here you can actually map it to individual databases. And typically I would, but I want to show you, make a distinction between this and user a little clearer. So I'm not going to right now. Securables, you can take a list of all the things that you can give permissions for on the server. And the current status, you know. So they're all there. Right now I'm just going to say foo. I'm going to do OK. And you'll see that foo exists down here. But foo has no permissions to do anything except connect. Nothing else. You can't look at anything, they can't touch anything, they can't, they, I mean, it would be a pretty frustrating existence probably. <laughs> so in Community Assist, in that security folder, and again, I'm not going to make you do any of this. This is show and tell. I'm going to make a new user. And so I am going to uh, SQL user with login. OK, and I'm going to give the user a name. It's, this time we'll call it foobar. And then I'll look at the login name. I have to find the login name. So this dialog box, which is off screen, I need to bring the whole thing down. I think. Basically, I'm going to look at what logins are there. And I'm going to browse. We could just type in foo, but there's foo. And I'll do a little check. Um, I got it from Browse. Uh, the first one I got by clicking the little three dots here. So I did this, and then I did Browse. Oh, oh, that's from the. I looked away for a second. That's from Community Assist Security Users. And then new user. All right. And for default schema, I'm going to, I'm just going to do DBO, which I think will be OK. That's just default database owner. I probably wouldn't do that for a thing. Now, this person has no uh, permissions, but I, that's fine. I'm going to leave it like that. So under users, we now have foobar, and foobar is mapped to the login foo. All right. So you log into the server, and you have permissions on one database right now, which is so you're a user in uh, community assist. Generally, that's how it works. It is possible to log into a database directly. As of 2015, SQL Server, not before. <laughs> but always it has been that you log into the server, right? And then uh, we connect to the server, and now we can connect to this. We still have no permissions. 
just as a sidebar, in like uh, SQL Server 2000, uh, Microsoft got a rep for being very insecure. And the reason wasn't that the database was inherently insecure, their server. It was because they shipped it with everything wide open. And they assumed that the database administrator would lock it all down. That didn't happen. So a lot of people attacked SQL Server and were very successful because the database administrators had not shut things down. So the way it ships now, since 2005, is with everything shut off. And the database administrator has to go and turn things on. <laughs> and it's much more secure because of that. Also, you don't have any permissions until they are explicitly granted. Right. So if you don't, if a permission isn't explicitly granted, you have no permissions. Does that make sense? So right now, the only permission that we have, if I look at FUBAR, I'm going to look at the properties again. And if I look at uh, membership, uh, it's no memberships. But they do have a, they do basically have a connect privilege. That's all they have. They can connect. I'm going to, do you guys know what roles are? Other than oh, cinnamon no. rolls. No. <laughs> <laughs> cinnamon roll sounds good. Um, a role is basically a collection of permissions. So, what you do is you, you create a role. Say in community assist, we could, if FUBAR was part of an employee, we could have an employee role, right? And then the employee would have certain permissions inside of the database. Um, whereas a, uh, you know, somebody that's a, um, just doing a donation would have also some permissions. We might do donation. Let me look. I have no roles here, so I should be okay. You know, because it's easier. Donation doesn't have as many permissions. Um, would have different permissions. They would be able to insert into donation table. They should be able to read the donation table, right, so that they can get their own information back. Uh, they should be able to read the services table and some of the, the basic information that you need, you know, just to know the database. But not a whole lot of permissions. Does that make sense? So one of the things things you have when you're thinking of these roles, and I'll get back to this when we talk about the actual assignment, is to think about who the actors are. Who uh, are you going to, who's going to be using the database and what permissions do they need to do what they need to do in the database, right? It's always related to essentially an actor would be a role. You don't want to assign permissions to individuals. If, for one, it's way too much work. Maybe it works if you have five people, but if you have 50 or 100 people, it's way too much work to go in and assign individual permissions. It's also harder to, when they leave, to just get rid of them, right? <laughs> so if they're just a member of a role, you just remove them from the role and all their permissions go away. It's just so much easier. Does that make sense? So roles are a better way to handle security than um, doing it individually. So I'm going to create a new database role. And let's just make it a, a donor role. And I'm just going to call it donor role. I'm going to make it a DBO. Okay, and I'm going to, in this, um, go to securables. And I'm going to do a quick search. Uh, Objects of the types. Oh, well, let's do all the objects belonging to the schema. DBO. Whoops. There is an employee schema already in here, I see. Okay. So these are all the objects that belong to the database owner. Because right? that's what I made as a default for this. And I can look at. Um, so community service is the table with the services, badly named, but that's what it is. 
And I don't know if you can see down here, there's all these different permissions, alter, control, delete, insert, reference, select. There's more permissions than I showed you, actually. But one of the things that they would probably need is the permission to select. That's really all they need off of that. And again, anything that's not granted is denied, right? So if I don't grant uh, them insert, they can't insert into it. They can, but they can select. They can read it. With grant is a little bit weird, and with grant just means that um, if somebody else has the permission, they can give you the permission on the fly, like in a stored procedure. They can, so you don't have the permission to insert. If I said with grant, that means that in a store procedure, somebody that ha is running a thing that has permission can temporarily, for one process, grant you the permission to do that. It's like a supervisor with the. Um... Right, or, or if you're in Linux, it's like um, going to root for a minute. <laughs> you know, but you can give you can give that permission. This is fairly rare. You never have to use deny. Uh, because anything that's not granted is denied, right? In fact, deny is not um, ANSI standard for SQL, because again, if it's not granted, it's denied. Um, so I'm going to do donation, and for donations, they need to be able to insert, and they need to be able to select. Is there anything else that they need to see here do? Right, we're just giving them certain permissions. Also, you can, although I don't suggest doing this, you can go into, so this is on the table donation, you can go in and you can actually grant or deny specific columns like so if you had a, a, an employee column that had all the private information and you wanted to deny to certain users to see like your social security number and all of that kind of stuff you could deny or just not grant once you start granting in here then the others start to get denied <laughs> if you don't then you, by default if you just select on the table you have permission for all the table but if you start picking and choosing in here, you can do that. I would suggest not doing that ever, actually. I would suggest creating a view instead. Is it, is it already the opposite where, where if you don't click anything on grant, but you start clicking checkboxes on deny, it grants everything else? It'll get, yeah. well, well, no. If you explicitly deny it, it just denies that. It yeah, it doesn't grant anything. The other thing to know, um, is you can belong to more than one group, like more than one role, all right? But it's always the more restrictive role that wins out if there's a conflict in permissions. So if one role says you can do something and another role says you can't, you can't. <laughs> yeah, so it always goes for the most restrictive. It's a problem, though, if you want, you know, you have a general employee role and you want to give somebody else super permissions or something, because you can't do that. If you make them a part of the employee role, then no matter what you do in the other role, it'll always devolve down to the, they, you know, so you have to actually create a whole separate role for super users or something. All right. I don't know if they need to see anything else. I'm just looking. You probably don't have all the tables that I do, because I have been um, doing stuff in other classes. So that's a role. Now, actually, one of the things I should have done for the role, which I didn't, um, I'm going to refresh on the role. And then database roles. And there's the uh, donor role. I'm going to go back to properties. The thing I didn't do was to add a user. Notice that the role has no role members. So I'm going to add a user 
And if I do browse again, it'll give me all my database users. I'll add foobar, and now they're added to the role. And we can do OK. And then I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll log in as foobar, and I'll show you what they can and cannot do. But before we do that, and this drives everybody crazy, I have to change the server itself. If I go to security on the server property, so what I did is I right clicked, I'll cancel and do it again. I right clicked off screen, didn't I? Let's do it some on screen. <laughs> I right clicked um, on properties and then I went to security. Notice it says Windows Authentication Mode. That's the only mode it will allow right now. So in order to allow me to log in as FooBar or Foo, I have to uh, change it to SQL Server and Windows. So it still will do Windows logins, but now it will also do SQL Server logins. When I click OK on that, it's going to say that these configuration effects won't take effect until I restart the server, which can be bad if this is a 24-7 server. But I'm going to do OK. Now, to restart the server, shutting down the management studio and bringing it back up does nothing. It has nothing to do with the server. All right, This is just a client. It's like PHP admin. It's just a client. It doesn't touch the server. There's a couple of ways you could do it. You could go into um, right click and go to computer management and go to services and shut it down. But actually, all you have to do is right click on the server here and say restart, which is a lot easier than going to the services. But you can go there. And it's going to ask me about a dozen different times if I really want to do it. And actually, I'll ask a couple. So once it's restarted, then I can do the login. But before that, it'll, and it doesn't give you a meaningful error message. It just says that the login failed. And you, you go crazy. Why did the login fail? I had the right password. I did it. And uh, this is because you haven't reset the server to allow it. But if that's not the error that it gives you. It just says that the login failed. So I am going to leave this. See how these are all kind of scrunched up? You can have multiple logins in the same management studio. So I'm just going to right click here. Actually, I don't want to right click there. I want to connect. I'm going to connect to the database engine, SQL Express. But instead of Windows authentication, I'm going to do SQL authentication. And then it needs my. Uh, login name and password. And it's the login, you want the login, not the uh, username. Oh, this is what the user you, you created. That's the user I created. And my password pass. was pass. Yeah. If I don't create anything, then follow you, I cannot use the server authority station. No, yeah, you have to have a password. And username. Right. Got it. So okay. I'm going to do connect. And it did connect. Notice this one up here says Steve, Win, you know, whatever. This one says Foo. <laughs> I haven't used Foo Bar in decades, actually. <laughs> so, um, what? Yeah, I think Foo Bar actually does have an obscene undercurrent. <laughs> No. An obscene undercurrent for the meaning of it. Oh. <laughs> well, I never saw that. Yeah. <laughs> they used to use it in the army a lot. Yeah. And it's also used. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it may not be the. I mean, the army one definitely had an obscene uh, <laughs> undercurrent. I'm not F2 sure if this one. Yeah. So many years ago, I worked for uh, 
the army as a civilian KP. It's right at the end of this uh, Vietnam War, actually, many, many years ago. What did they have? There so weren't any computers what? there. <laughs> it was, <laughs> they were trying to transition from a draft to a volunteer army, mm -hmm. so they weren't making the soldiers do KP anymore, kitchen mm -hmm. police. <laughs> I was only about 17. It was. Anyway, I learned a lot from them. Notice that I can't get into that database because I don't have permissions. I can see it. And the reason I can see the databases is that I um, did the DBO in the master is where it's stored. But um, so I don't know which ones you have probably not most of these. In community assist, I can open it. When I open the tables, notice I can only see two tables, the ones I have permission on. And if I tried, like, so if I do a new query and I try to insert into community service, And I get the columns for community service. You just copy the column and then they get all the order. If you if you just grab it. you can just grab the folder, yeah. I see. I did I did this. Well I need to get rid of that. Yeah. Service description. Uh, what would be a new service? Although I think there should be a community. Isn't there a name in there? Yeah, service name. Did I get rid of that? OK, service maximum. These are monies, so the most they can get is like 500. Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't matter what I write here in a way. I do need to, the reason it's all underlined, <coughs> OK. When I do that, it's going to say the insert permission was denied because I don't have permission right now. But I could do a select. So I can do a select on that. And I could do an insert into donation, because I gave that permission, right? So do you want me to do that, or do you believe me? <laughs> I guess I can do it fairly quickly. And donation. Now I don't need those. Uh, values. I don't need donation key either, actually. I just need the date, which I'll just do get date. Uh, amount, 450, 77. Okay, and then uh, person key, four. Whoever that person is, they're donating. Uh, but it will allow this to happen. Uh, why is it saying create table? Oh, I know why. There's a trigger on this. That shouldn't have triggered the trigger. Uh, 
There's a trigger for a big donation. So. No, I don't know why it's so. I would have to give it permission to create table. These are problems that can come up. I wasn't actually meaning to do this. Actually, I don't want to do it on foobar. I want to do it on rolls. So it doesn't have that as a – how do I give them permission on a table that doesn't ex – there's big donations. Uh, no, it's not insert, it's create. Where is the create permission? So I'm going to just grant create. Should be oh. No, actually, it should be grant create on table big donations. That should work. Well, I don't think it works to have two to donor role. That doesn't work. It, 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 the other way was more correct. What I have to, it, well, what it wants shouldn't be right. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I have to give them the permission to grant. Generally, this syntax is pretty simple, and it's usually just two.
that'll work. That's scary, though. I mean, if I were doing this for real, that's scary because I've just given them the right to create any table. <laughs> no, they can create a table. So when I do this now, if it's updated, what? All right, let's not worry about the insert. That works. Insert into donation. Oh, you know what? The function. All right, let's just enter a date. What is today? Um, yeah, that's right. It's leap year. No, it still doesn't like DPO. Strange. I when I typed in DBO, I probably should have clicked it in. Anyway, this is how you grant. Just real quickly, if you want to create a login, just to show you this, and then I'll go to the assignment. So you you basically create login. Oh, anybody have a new name for a login? George. Um, with password equals pass. Uh, so then you'd want to do like um, use community assist, create user for login. George, oh, we get, need to give the user a name, which could be the same even for login George. Um, and then it, you know, create a role. And then um, you could do grant select insert uh, on service grant to client role grant select on community service to client role. Is there anything else that we would need to give permissions to for a client role? It's good enough for now. SP, actually let's do execute, SP add role member. Um, Client role and uh, George. So these are the equivalent of everything that I did, you know, with the the, the GUI. So this creates um, a login called George. I'm going to use community assist and it will create a user called George that is mapped to the George in the login. I'm going to create a client role. I'm going to grant some permissions to the client role. And then I'm going to add George. This SP add role member is a built in stored procedure. Right, so that you can use. So if I refresh the security folder over here um, and refresh 
the security folder outside of that. And I look at the logins, notice that there's a George in the logins. And if I go up to the database security one, there's a George in the users. And if I go to roles and do database roles, there is now a client role. If I do the properties, George is a member of it. And in the securables, it has community service and service grant. And if we scroll down for the community service, we see select. And for the service grant, we see insert and select. So everything that I did in these dialog boxes can be done over here. And it's actually faster in the query window to do these things. I'll post those too. And then let me go back and just talk about what the actual task is. <laughs> Any questions on those? This can be kind of fun to set up some security. You have to really think about it, which I wasn't doing, right? I was just making things up as we went. But really, you need to think through the security. So in the assignment, it basically asks you, it gives you a little database scenario, and it asks you to think about what the security would be. And the first task in that is to think about who are the actors. Who are the people that are going to be using the database? <clears throat> so basically identify them. Uh, who is going to use the database? Then you want to look at each actor. And I suggest something like, can I do this? Is, can I insert a table here? Well, so the actors could be, I mean, in the in the problem, it gives you a database scenario. Mm -hmm. I think it is artists. But, but it's also like fan, the fans log in, mm -hmm. whoever would be using the database. And then you would want to, for each table, mm -hmm. so you would list the tables. So say the actor is, let's do the fans. I forget the exact problem, actually. So the tables are, let's say that there's ven, venue, artist, um, what? Fan is one. Yeah, fan. So if you look at that in the tables, the permissions, and maybe one of the easiest ways to do that would be, actually, let's tab, tab. You could do your pro properties, select, insert, update, delete. And I don't care about all the others right now. And then you could say the fan. This is all for the fan, right? The fan should have a right to select artists, uh, venues, right, but not you wouldn't have any update or delete on that table, right? It would just have a right to see what the venues are. Same pro probably for the artists. Um, they would uh, not be able to do that, add artists or that. For the fan table itself, they would need to be able to select. They would need to be able to insert because they are going to register, right? And you probably would want to give them some update permit permissions. Now, if you want, you could do some notes at the end here to say that, you know, basically you would only want them to, to be able to uh, update own records only, right? So what I'm looking for in the security thing, and this is when you build your, do the security for the apartment building too, it's just something like this, just a sort of a simple grid of what permissions each user would have on each table. Does that make sense? 
And then you can, as I said, you can have some comments because they're, they're going to need insert permissions, but we there are ways to do it, but it's, we'd have to ensure that programmatically that they can only update their own, right? The stored procedures or something. So that this is more what the actual assignment looks like. Do you guys want me to talk about disaster recovery, which is the very last thing, or wait? Wait. <laughs> All right, so we'll wait on the disaster recovery. Um, just as a shortcut, disaster recovery is just what do you do to make sure that you don't lose your data? Right? Yeah. Oh, well, I know you were asking. Oh, no. I was just saying real quickly, it's just. So, and it can be really complex if your data needs and your industry is really complex. Um, but on the, the the minimum would be to back up and uh, on a to a different drive and probably say store that drive somewhere securely. Is there journaling in SQL Server? There's I don't know. There's uh, log sharing, log shipping. Okay. Which might be the same. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not. Log shipping is where you take the log records all the transactions. You can ship that log to you another can, machine. Or you can you might go partially forward in time. You have to apply the whole log. Um, usually when they ship the log, it's the whole log. Now you on recovery, you can stop at a certain point in time. It, you know, so if you know that you did something really horrible at 1259 uh, AM you can restore up to 1258 <laughs> uh, and not, you know, just stop short of where you did the disastrous thing. Um, so there's log shipping. There's a thing called mirroring. There's all sorts of cluster setups where files are shared among multiple computers. Typically, the, uh, on a big company, big industry, the database is copied not only locally across multiple machines, but all over the country or all over the world on multiple machines. So that if LA falls into the sea, they have a copy in London. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, I will post this. I might comment it a little bit more. And um, I'll post the SQL that where we made the Thing. But really, all you have to do is think about what the security would be, you know, for the different users. So they get two parts: identify the users, and then for each user, what would their basic security context look like? Per table. Yeah, per table. And I would have put this into a table, but I see WordPad doesn't support a table. And I didn't input I didn't put Office into the virtual machine. The um, machine is big enough. <laughs> other questions? And then you can do all the other stuff for, um, there's, as I said, there are these two individual assignments left. And then there's just the. Um, the group stuff for apartment. The other thing, um, if you haven't done the quizzes, do them. Most of them will let you do more than once. And uh, the midterm, I don't know if there will be a final, but the midterm is just a survey. You have nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> so you should do it, because there are points attached to it, but it is just a survey. <laughs> what? <laughs> They're in campus, yeah. I. Yes. They, yeah, I mean, basically, you can do them whenever. Yeah, and, and again, they, they sh most of them should let you do it three times. I think there was one or two that got. Yeah, and I meant to reset them, but. Once somebody's taken it, they won't let me reset. So there's like one or two. Yeah. And then the quizzes are open book, open whatever. You know, so. 
And and with three times, it's only five questions in a quiz. So. <laughs> Okay. They help me with a lot of this. I would do them before I did the project and use it as a reference. Okay, well, that's good. It was really, it was pretty helpful, actually. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I might, I've thought about creating a real midterm and a real final, but I don't know. I would still probably make it a free try. I love your midterms. <laughs> yeah. I think they're great. The one that's just a survey? Yeah. Well, it was meant to help me. My problem is that I should have made it an actual date to be done because if somebody's really having problems and they tell me now, yeah. it's getting late. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, All right. I need to ask. Uh, how do I be distant? So it doesn't have a provider for this version of itself. Oh, it's a uh, 2007 and two. Yeah. But is it 2007? So 2003. Right now, but is, what version is your actual set? I can, I, can, I can change the version in the right one, but it still has uh, another window. I can change my file. To, uh, I think you might have to download it. Download uh, I changed the version at my home to yeah, no, no. I still have problem that can import it. Right, so the OLED can be... Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, if you want. Um, okay. It works much easier than I don't know. We just started losing it now. Then in here, it can be more, more, more. Really? I'm looking to see. Oh, yeah, right here. Do we need to do it on the tour? Yeah, I know, but I don't think that's Oh, it's just the state Yeah, it's still. Okay, we have to all I might do this, but I need to. Yeah, 
Oh, you want to copy that message? Yeah, that's what I want to do. Those are look like I got. Uh, so when I text you back to the message. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, my God. And then I had time. I 
Okay, there's one question. I'm not sure. Wow. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah.